Welcome, 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 everyone. My clock says 12 noon, so let's get started. My name is Jeff Jensen, Director of Community Programs here at Trees Forever, and we have quite the webinar lined up for you today. This is the first of several inspirational and educational webinars that we're featuring this summer as part of the Our Woodland Legacy series. Uh, we're kicking things off, learning all about gravel beds today, and then later this fall, we're going to wrap up our woodland legacy with a tree planting of some trees that are growing right now in gravel beds in Marion and Cedar Rapids. Uh, that tree planting will be in the Cedar Rapids area, and it'll include a social uh, for networking so that we can all meet face to face, and that'll be a lot of fun. Speaking of face-to-face, -face, uh, that is an excellent segue into my next slide, which is a refresher on how these webinars work. You should be able to hear and see us, but we can't hear or see you. So the way that you communicate with us is through the questions tab. Go ahead and type a question in the box and then we'll get it answered. Although we do have a recorded presentation today, so we'll certainly be holding all of our questions to the end. Before we get into learning about gravel beds, I want you to mark your calendars for July 28th, which is our next Our Woodland Legacy webinar. And it'll be a food forest forum featuring Trees Forever staff members, Gina Bulo talking about mushrooms, uh, Nick McGrath talking about other edibles and landscaping with edibles in mind. And then I'll talk about some nut and berry options for backyards. It's fixing to be a nutty good time, so don't miss that one. And then in August, we're going to feature Tivon Feely, Iowa DNR. Uh, he's going to fill us in on the ticking time bomb that is invasive species. This will be relevant to many homeowners and woodlot owners, so mark your calendars so you don't miss a beat. And since I have a captive audience, I also want to put a plug in for Stewards of the Beautiful Land, which is an educational and a training series focused on native landscapes that we partner with the Tallgrass Prairie Center and local county conservation boards on. Part of Stewards of the Beautiful Land is a series of webinars every two weeks and then in-person field days once per month in June, July, August, and September in select counties. Now, the counties that we're partnering with this year include Carroll, Dickinson, Franklin, and Mahaska County. Upcoming webinars include landscaping for water quality, pollinator palooza, ooh, that sounds interesting, and the big picture of Iowa forestry with ISU Extension Forestry Specialist, Billy Beck. To learn more about stewards and the upcoming webinars and field days, click on the Learn tab and then Stewards of the Beautiful Land, and that'll bring you to the landing page where you can find more information and then register for events. Oh yeah, here are the dates for some of those first field days in June, starting in Franklin County next Tuesday, where I'll be with DNR District Forester Joe Herring, who will be on hand uh, to answer your tree questions. The next night, Brad's going to be in Carroll County. And then finally, uh, Oskaloosa later in the month with uh, Peter Lundgren. And finally, <laughs> this is almost like the previews at the movie theater, right? You have to sit through the first uh, 15 minutes of advertisements before getting to the featured presentation. Okay, I promise this is the last one. But we have a couple of tremendous events that we're hosting next week. So Tuesday night in Hampton and then Wednesday night in West Union. Now, these are going to be fantastic opportunities to learn about how to grow your canopy in town. And then we'll share the top 10 tips and uh, we'll have some fun looking at some different trees, answering tree questions. I hope to see you there. Visit the Trees Forever website and the events calendar for details and to register. And here we are, the main event, the moment you've all been waiting for. 
our speaker today, Gary Johnson, Professor Emeritus, Urban and Community Forestry with the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources. Uh, just a little bit about Gary. He's been a professor and researcher in urban forestry and landscape management at three major universities. That's New Hampshire, Maryland, and Minnesota. Uh, he's a licensed and practicing certified arborist in two states, a landscape design build business owner, and superintendent of grounds for an Illinois university. He has an obsession with trees. He's been a tree hugger all of his life. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Johnson. Hello, my name is Gary Johnson. I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources. And today we're gonna to be discussing uh, community gravel beds as alternatives for communities that need to reforest, but in particular for those communities that are working with limited budgets. So as we go through, uh, these are the, the seven sections that I'm gonna be discussing as we go through, and hopefully they'll make sense as, as we touch on them. So before we get uh, really into the meat of this discussion, there are a few, a um, little bit of nomenclature that's kind of unique to uh, tree nurseries and, and uh, not so intuitive to people that are either foresters or, or, or normal people. So when we talk about gravel for a gravel bed, you can use a lot of different types of gravel. Uh, and, they, and they can range from three eighths of an inch in diameter to three quarters of an inch. And we've used all of those. Um, washed gravel is usually the preferred gravel because it's rounded and it rolls off the roots easily when you harvest the trees. Uh, bare root plants, that's pretty intuitive. These are trees that have been grown in nurseries, in the field, and then harvested with no soil uh, around the roots. Uh, liners, these are woody plants that um, most of the time, liners are sold to other nurseries. And then those nurseries, like a retail nursery, will grow those on uh, to larger sizes. And, um, and then market them as, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14 foot tall trees. Whips, whips are, are, are liners. Um, and they look like a whip, quite honestly, and they're bare rooted. Uh, they can, they're, they're just as frequently unbranched as they are with light branches on them. So that's, that's basically those types of trees. A caliper tree, however, is a tree that these are what most people buy in retail nurseries. And caliper is the width of the stem of the tree measured at approximately six inches above the first main order root. So if you if you go to most, most nurseries or if you look at the trees that most communities plant on their boulevards, most of the time those are gonna be between one and three quarter and two inch caliper trees. That, that seems to be a, a size of a tree that looks like a tree. The last thing on here is the ANSI Z60.1. Um, you, should, you should enter this and save it on your smartphone. This is your, this is your uh, assurance that when you're buying nursery stock, that it meets the standards for, um, for these ANSI standards that were developed by the American Nurserymen Association. So uh, this is your protection for size, for the quality of the plant, uh, and that you're getting exactly the plant that you ordered. So now we're going to look at gravel as a healer. And notice that I did not misspell healer. Um, I do not advocate gravel beds to be growing beds. Uh, these are temporary um, places to heal in. That's why it's spelled that way. Uh, the, the, the roots to keep them moist until you have time to plant them out in the landscape. So when you buy bare rooted trees in the spring, it's important to know that they were actually harvested from the field the previous autumn. And then they're put in cold storage and then they start shipping them out, depending on the part of the country, oh, between February and, and May is when they get shipped out. Healing is, has been a nursery practice for literally hundreds of years. And in this photograph, uh, the healing bed to the left that's using real coarse sand to the right is sawdust. Sand works well, sawdust works well too. Um, but pea stone has some real advantages to it. And the big advantage is when you lift 
the bare rooted tree out of the uh, uh, healed in bed with pea stone, the stones just roll right off. You, you really don't lose any roots unless you intentionally cut them off. So that's the big advantage of pea stone versus um, finer sands and, and especially versus like wood chips or uh, an organic mulch that the roots tend to grow right into those organic mulches and you lose a lot of the roots when you lift them. So when we're, when we're looking at a material that's gonna be optimum for, for healing in um, these roots, we, we wanna keep this optimum oxygen and moisture ratio. It has to have enough oxygen in there for the roots to respire and continue to grow. And it needs enough moisture that they don't dry out. Um, but you can have too much moisture too. So we need to make sure that the gravel bed has good drainage. Um, it's always nice if the material that you're using to heal in doesn't break down. Uh, and pea stone, not in our lifetime, is not going to break down. So you can just keep using it over and over and over again. Um, the other nice thing, another nice thing about gravel is you're not going to have problems with disease or insects uh, as you would with a more organic type of material for healing in. There, there's nothing for diseases or insects to live on. It's rocks. Um, it's recyclable. And then, as I mentioned earlier, when you lift the trees, there's hardly any root loss. Um, commercially, gravel beds have been used for quite a few years. This is a Jim Whiting Nursery in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And this is about a third of an acre. And I'll talk more about this type of gravel bed uh, in size, a third of an acre in size, and he's been selling that wholesale and retail for 30 years now in 2023. Um, one, of the, one of the real advantages, and actually this is how our research at the University of Minnesota started, was back in uh, the early 2000s, we were looking at, can we help pot-bound plants recover from that encircling root system and, and build a better root system. If you look at the red arrow on here, you can see this kind of squared off um, soil root. And, and I'm gonna talk about how we create that box system later, but all the other roots growing like towards you in the screen, those have all been regenerated in a, in a pea stone gravel bed. And notice how they're no longer encircling. They grow right straight out. Another way of building better root systems, this is not a, at all unusual for calipered um, bur oaks in this case. Bur oak has been one of our bigger challenges. And the challenge a lot of times start when you get the plants, um, when they're dug from the field, their root systems are pretty darn sparse. And the larger they are, the more difficult it is for the trees to establish. When you place these trees, um, and, and there's going to be some species differences, too, that we'll discuss. But when you place these trees in gravel, the, the fine root system just explodes in there. Uh, it has all the energy it needs. It's already stored in the tree because, you know, remember last autumn, it was still growing in the field. And so it has the energy. And now you put it in a system with optimum oxygen and moisture and the fine roots just explode out. This is one of our uh, earlier studies, and this actually has some relevance uh, to, I think, your community or, or your organization. But we were trying to develop better liners with better root systems. So we started playing around, except we're researchers, so we don't play around. We experiment, it's a fancy word for playing around, with different mixes. And we had larger stone, we had the pea stone, we had pea stone mixed with sand, and we had pea stone mixed with water holding materials. Basically, it's expanded clay. And in this in this randomized study, we, we looked at all the root responses, different species too. And in the end, um, a couple of things came out of it. Um, plain old pea stone, just 100% pea stone. If you're going to do one thing, that's what you go to. If you want to give it a little bit more water holding, um, you know, personality to it, go 90% pea stone and 10% of the coarsest sand you can find. And those ended up being our, our best media for growing trees. And another thing that we, we started too, because with the nut species, nut species are notorious for sending out tap roots and, and it takes them a while to form a good fibrous root system. Well, so we started sowing, direct sowing seeds in gravel and this is what we got. This is with black walnut 
one of those trees that notoriously has a taproot system. And these trees are about three months old. And look at the fibrous root system on it. It's just perfect. This is what you want. Um, again, this is a burr oak. And you can see we, we direct sowed the acorns. And right away, instead of having a, a dominant taproot system, look at all the fine roots that are developing off of this. Uh, and this is white oak, uh, even, even better. So if you want to start some trees from the seeds, and um, we, we, we've, we've grown a lot of them from seed in Peastone, give it a shot, give it a try. Uh, the only problem you may have would be squirrels or uh, streaking gophers or something. So sometimes you have to put like a, a screen or some type of protection over the gravel to keep those little critters from digging down in. Okay, we also worked with rooted uh, cut cuttings. So this is Manchurian ash. And uh, these are cuttings that were rooted in, in pretty sparse roots. And then we put them in gravel. And this is about six weeks later in gravel. So you can see this explosion of, of fine roots in it. Now, man, this, this is, a, this is a, a name, a term, rehabilitation that I stole from somebody very close to you, uh, that I think reflects exactly what we're doing. So a lot of times with the containerized root systems, when you purchase them, especially towards the middle or the end of the season, they have um, encircling roots. I mean, really packed in woody encircling roots. And one of the problems with that is they stay encircling unless you do something about it. Another issue that we often find too is that the trees are buried too deeply in that container. You, you want that first main order root when, when you go to plant them in the landscape to be within one inch of the soil surface. So we developed a couple techniques for correcting that. And one of them is, uh, like in the previous slide, we determine how much ex -soil, excess soil is over that first main order root. And we just, we literally saw it off with, a, with an old pruning saw, making sure we don't cut into the stem. Okay, that, that takes care of the depth. Now we want to take care of these encircling roots. And especially, th this photo is not too bad. They're pretty fine roots. Those are no big deal. You don't even really need to do anything with those. But if the encircling roots are about the diameter of a pencil, like you see in some of these, then you need to do something. So we came up with this, um, this solution that has worked 100% of the time, and it's called boxing. And if you can, if you've ever been to a Greek restaurant and you've seen them slice off meat for a euro, uh, that's kind of what you're doing here. You go in about one inch uh, from the edge of the container and go around four sides, and you just saw that off. You box it. So if you if you look at um, the pot bound river birch to the left, it's freshly boxed, so it's no longer a round root system. It's kind of squared off, and then we put it in pea stone gravel bed. And if you look at it, that's the very same plant five weeks later. You see this explosion of fine roots, but more importantly, none of them are encircling anymore. So there are a lot of uses for community gravel beds, saving money, building better root systems, recovering pot-bound plants. And, uh, and, the, and the nice thing is they're, they're very space efficient and you're not wasting good soil. So I'm going to take you through a number of communities now and show you different styles of gravel beds, uh, ones that we recommend, ones that we highly recommend, and ones that we say, don't ever do that. Uh, just not so good. NSG, not so good. So this is in Morris, Minnesota. This is a raised bed. They've just burned up soil uh, to the outside of it a little bit. And this is fairly typical. It's a good starter bed. But before we you know, go to any of these beds, I think it's important one more time to look at the economics of it. And if you, this is based on uh, prices of nursery stock in the upper Midwest, all for the same size of a tree. This would be one and three quarter to a two inch caliper tree. And you can see the, the incredible savings that you make on a bare root tree of this large size, inch and, inch and three quarters to two inch caliper tree a lot cheaper than a bald and burlap uh, plant. And it's a lot lighter too. A, a bare root two inch caliper tree is gonna weigh about 20 pounds. A bald and burlap two inch caliper tree is gonna weigh about 350 pounds. Um, and then a containerized tree is somewhere in the middle. Um, it's heavier, it's more expensive. And then it has the issue with the, uh, with the encircling roots. 
So here's another community. It's another raised bed. This is in Hendricks, Minnesota. And uh, they this is this is typical for a community too. All volunteers built that. We were on site to provide technical assistance, but um, you can see this is above ground. It's about 15 inches of gravel in there. Um, the outside supports, I'll talk more about that later, uh, are on this one are every four feet on center. I recommend doubling that up every two feet on center. But they've been using this bed since 2009. And each year for this community of about 750 people, they harvest, they put in and then they harvest about 75 trees uh, that are planted in their parks and in their boulevards. So constructing these raised beds, this is generally how you start. You want to get rid of any organic matter, living organic matter. So you, if you're going to build on soil, which, you know, I really don't recommend putting gravel on top of good productive soil. But in this particular place, they didn't have a choice. Um, so scraped off the sod, organic material, and then start putting in your corner post, your four corner post, squaring it up and leveling it. Now, squaring it up, this is, this is your chance to use that Pythagorean theorem that you had to learn in geometry class. And you probably have wondered, when am I ever gonna use this? You're gonna use it if you wanna square something up. You do not have to have a perfectly square gravel bed. It's just a matter of pride when people look at it and see that it is square, it is level, and it looks more professional. It, it, it looks better than just somebody throwing together some boards and posts and dumping some gravel in there. It's just, it looks, it's an aesthetic thing. We also recommend no nails. Uh, we, we recommend uh, all pressurized wood materials and then use bolts and screws, galvanized obviously, instead of nails. And this allows you, uh, if the time comes to take it apart, you can take it apart and move it somewhere else. You can take it apart and use the lumber for something else. So you, nothing, nothing is destroyed. Those posts are not set in concrete. They're just set right down in the soil. And the rule of thumb is uh, if you have a post that's um, 18 inches above ground, you want a minimum of 18 inches below ground. I would probably get a four foot post, 18 inches above ground, three and a half feet below ground. And that makes them nice and solid. You don't need concrete. And, you know, depending on the community, you know, you can, you can get kind of uh, innovative with how you, how you construct this. This particular community um, was right next to uh, the machine shop. So they had these L braces created for them, cut the length, and this really stiffened up the corners and just, it made a, a, a stronger and better bed for them. Some of the communities have used landscape timbers. And again, NSG, yeah, it means not so good. I would not recommend using landscape timbers. Um, for one thing, they will warp on you. Uh, contrary to what you're, you're going to be told, they're going to warp. You know, and if there if there is an edge, if they're an edging, you know, partially buried underground, it's no big deal. But if they're sticking above ground like this, um, they split, they warp. Uh, they're not perfectly square, and and so it ends up you you put a lot of work into something like this, and it, it doesn't look that great. Uh, by the way, when if you decide to use this, if you decide that I'm crazy and you want to go ahead and use these. These are attached by drilling all the way through and then use a 3 8 reinforcing bar. It's called rebar. Uh, and you can get these from any hardware store, or lumber yard, et cetera. And then you pound those rebars through the holes and that anchors everything together. And that first course of landscape timbers, half of it's gonna be below ground. And that's gonna help preventing the bottom uh, from kicking out. Oops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. All right. This is in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. They poured this concrete. This was a, an old alleyway by the maintenance building, and they poured this concrete specifically for parking and for the gravel bed. And when they, when they poured this concrete, if you look at these metal posts to the outside, these are actual round metal poles. And where they go down to the concrete, 
um, they put PVC piping in there. So these poles actually slip right down in to the PVC pipes that are embedded in the concrete, which is really slick. And then the poles, these posts, and these happen to be between two and four feet on center. Those are bolted then into the, the sideboards. But again, with this one, if they ever decide they want to move this better or they need more parking or they have more trees and they can manage, easy peasy to take this whole thing apart. And the nice thing is you haven't covered up good productive soil. If you can't build it on an old concrete sidewalk or an old gravel alleyway or, or something and you have to go on soil, I highly recommend that uh, once you construct the box frame, you put geotextile liner uh, at the bottom before you put the P-stone in. If you don't do that, if you build on soil and you don't put this film down, the P-stone gets lost. It works its way down into the soil. And if you ever have to scoop up as you harvest the trees, you're going to be mixing in soil with a pea stone. And it it just it ends up being a less productive bed. And then you then you can, because there's organic matter in it, you can get um, diseases, insect issues with it. Uh, depending on what you're going to be uh, healing in, you know, with shrubs, 12 inches of stone is plenty. With almost all trees you'll be working with, um, 15 to 18 inches of pea stone is way more than enough. Um, irrigation, they have to be irrigated. And uh, one of the more common questions is like, well, how much do I put down? Well, you put down enough that when you put your hand down in the gravel, once you get down well, maybe two or three inches, it's moist. If you look at these trees, they look a little bit mounded. Uh, you're not planting trees in a gravel bed, you're healing them in. So what we recommend is you heal them in with four, four or five, six inches of the stone over the root system. And that's gonna, that's gonna be a little bit of insulation, keeping the, the pea stone from drying out so quickly. If you had the roots right at the surface, you'd be, you'd be watering all the time. But um, you just have to figure out yourself, depending on the exposure, depending on the type of irrigation system, how frequently you have to turn on the irrigation system and how long you have to let it run. And the only way to really tell I mean, you can use a tensiometer, hook it up to a computer if you have more money than you know what to do with, or you can use your hand and just dig down in two, three, four inches. If it's moist, we're good to go. Uh, the pop-up heads, um, this is a, a real favorite and it has a real advantage over the soaker hose in the previous uh, slide. Soaker hoses basically are water fountains for rabbits and squirrels and streaky gophers. And uh, they start, you know, if all they did was lick the water that's coming out of the soaker hose, that'd be no problem. But they don't do it. They are just determined to chew into it. And within a few days, you'll notice you have all these geysers coming out of the gravel bed uh, from the critters chewing through. Um, Pop-up heads like these, it's real easy to set up. Uh, it's, it's a very reasonable uh, irrigation setup. So I highly recommend these. All right, this is probably my absolute favorite gravel bin. This is in the city of North St. Paul. They had a bunch of old dumpsters. They didn't know what to do with them. Um, if you look to the right, you can see the irrigation system is hooked up to a water hydrant uh, instead of a, a spigot. But inside that, that uh, dumpster, there's a foot and a half of gravel and they just heal their, their trees and shrubs right in there. When it's time to plant these out, if they take, if they're planting in the park, they just, they just load up the dumpster, take it to the park, pull out the tree. Oh, it's just, it's so cool. I, I love this system. Um, and, you know, they didn't invest, they used what they already had. The only investment in it was the cost of the trees. Uh, here's another one, one of my favorites. This was near um, a community garden. This is in Friendly Fridley, Minnesota. And near this community garden, they had this compost bin that for years, people, when they'd work in the garden, they would just throw the refuse, the organic refuse in there. Well, it wasn't really being used that much. And so they just converted it. They took out the organic matter, uh, put a gravel bottom in it, and this is their gravel bed now. Note the screening to the front. That's to keep critters out. Bunnies, well, not so much squirrels, but bunnies and deer. 
uh, keep them out from grazing on the trees. And you can see the hose to the, to the left that's going off to the left to the water source too. Uh, and they have, this one is set up with sprinkler heads. Okay, those, uh, we're, we're kind of segueing from the traditional um, four-sided bed. And if you notice, especially in, the, in this last one in Friendly Fridley, the fourth side, those were actually tubes of sand. And if you live in the upper Midwest and you have a two-wheel drive pickup truck, you've probably bought tubes of sand before in the wintertime to give a little bit of traction. Um, now we're going to go to a three-sided bed. So this is at one of our research facilities. And this one in particular, 12 feet wide, this particular one is 40 feet long. And note that there's only three sides. And the reason for this is so they can they can stock it with a tractor and they can harvest it with a tractor, tractor with a front end loader. Um, if you if you heal in a lot of trees in a gravel bed and um, and they're in their fast rooting trees like elms and willows and crab apples, it's a lot of work to dig get those out by hand. Uh, and so if you can substitute hand labor with a front end loader and a tractor, it's going to be the best day of your life. Uh, this is in Fargo, Minnesota. Uh, they took it a little bit fancier, actually. So you can see that this, this is all concrete. Uh, it slopes down and at the bottom of the slope to the right, you can't see it. There are drainage holes. So it actually captures a lot of rainwater that ends up getting down to uh, the root system to the gravel. And as you can see, they, they stock it using front end loaders and they harvest it using a front end loader. This is a permanent system and, and they, they use gravel bed trees for over 80% of the trees that they plant in the city in parks of uh, Fargo. It's such a good system for them. Again, another three-sided bed. This is in a small, this is near Wabasha, Minnesota. And um, the third side on this is just a quickly removable uh, plank, two planks actually. And then they can go in with a front end loader and carefully lift the trees out that way and, and cut down harvest time to next to nothing. Uh, this particular area, you can see they're using soaker hoses and for whatever reason, they didn't have problems with squirrels and rabbits in this area, so it worked out well for them. To the top right, these look like store-bought, um, almost like landscape Jersey barriers, but this is in Bemidji, Minnesota, and they pour a lot of concrete up there, sidewalks and streets, et cetera. So what they did was at the end of the day, when they come back, if there was excess concrete in the, uh, in the truck, they would pour it into these molds that they made for these blocks. So all these blocks were made from extra excess concrete. And then they just lift them with a forklift and, and they made their beds. So again, this is a three-sided drive-in bed. And you can see they're installing um, the P-Stone now with a front end loader, easy peasy. If you look to the lower left, same thing, we're stocking. This is one of our research beds. And those white things that you see, those are um, polyurethane Jersey barriers. When they're empty, they weigh 33 pounds a piece. When you fill them with water, and I also put antifreeze in, because I leave them filled year round, uh, they weigh four, a little over 400 pounds. And again, you can see where the forklift uh, forks can slip right underneath them. You can move them around. It's just great. So stocking a bed like this, a three-sided bed, it's a two-person operation. Harvesting, it's a two-person operation. So there are a lot of advantages to it. The simplest and uh, the cheapest, and it works quite well too, is just dump the gravel on the, on the ground. Hopefully you don't dump it on, on good soil or good grass. Uh, but again, in this particular community, and um, this is eight in Minnesota, they didn't have a choice. They had to do it somewhere. So they just dumped it. Here. This works perfectly fine. Yes, you're going to have some drifting. Some of that uh, pea stone is going to drift out. Uh, it'll take a little bit of extra pea stone, but it, it works just fine. You don't have to be fancy. And now we're back to uh, Jim Whiting's nursery in Rochester. This is one third acre and it's all open bed. And it, the only sides that it has are those tubes of sand, you know, and they're about, I don't know, maybe eight inches high, six or eight inches high when they're full. Um, and, and he's, like I said, it's 30 years. The summer's 30 years he's had this bed. He just keeps expanding it. One other thing I want to mention on this 
he sells wholesale, but he also sells retail. So when he sells retail out of this commercial bed, each tree shrub comes with a two-year warranty. If this isn't working for him, he would be bankrupt by now. And obviously it's working for him. This is what I love to see. This is another gravel bed in uh, city of Rochester. And again, most of their trees are gravel bed trees now. Bare rooted trees, this is an old parking lot near the fairgrounds there. Wasn't being used for anything. So they moved in some Jersey barriers just to kind of contain on two sides, contain uh, the pea stone from drifting away. And if you look, there's kind of, it looks like a tripod with four legs. And coming up out of the center of that, that's the irrigation head. So it's a big spray head. And, and that's what they use in here to, to irrigate. Nice, simple bed, works swell. And everything is done with a front end loader and one or two people. All right, here's another option, an in-ground bed. This is the first bed that I built at a research field. And I want you to note on this, this is 60 feet long and it's 12 feet wide and it's broken into compartments. So we could conduct, you know, different research, different materials, different trees. And this was foolish of me and I freely admit it um, because we don't recommend, we don't leave trees, at least on purpose. We don't leave trees and gravel through the winter. I don't know what I was thinking, of, but I thought, all right, it's cold up here. We better go below ground. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you look in this first bed closest to you, if you look at that far right corner, you see something black. Uh, that's a sump pump um, area. Every time it rains, we had to install the sump pumps in those tubular sleeves and pump out the gravel bed. Do not, do not build a gravel bed below ground. There's no need for it, and it's nothing but a mistake. Okay, now we're going to talk about harvesting and transporting and planting the trees, the fun part. So the, the fun part's not so fun if you have 100 trees and you have to dig them all out by hand, especially if they're elms that root just like crazy in gravel or willows or crab apples or, uh, oh my gosh, don't ever put black locust in a gravel bed, not even purple robe, uh, the highly desirable variety because they just the roots explode in there and oh my gosh it, it just takes you forever and it's a back killer to get these trees out so but if it's a small bed then you're only producing you know 25 or 50 trees you know hand harvesting is just fine don't don't buy a tractor with a front end loader as soon as you pull them out the easiest thing to do is put them in black plastic plastic bags garbage bags and sit them off someplace that's shady you do not want the sun heating up those black plastic bags because you're going to parboil the roots. Um, okay, something happened. I'm going to have to go previous. There we go. The nice thing about uh, a gravel bed, too, when it comes to harvest, you can harvest any time. Here we ba we're back in Fargo now. They install the, the trees in the beds uh, late March, early April. They start pulling them out for planting in mid to late June. So they're really not in there for a long time. But by mid to late June, that kind of spring crush of work, they've, they've kind of gotten past that. And so now they can start devoting time uh, to actually starting to pull the trees and plant them. And we, we've pulled trees in full leaf, Memorial Day, July the 4th, all through the summer when it's hot. As long as you keep those roots moist, very good transplant success, except for sumac. I do have to say that 100% uh, mortality when I pulled sumac in the middle of the summer, 100% survival if I waited till October. But that's that was the only tree that was, or shrub that was kind of stinky about it. Like this, this is typical. Um, this was not pulled, dug out with a shovel. This was literally just pulled up crab apple. And you can see nice intact root system. Easy peasy. Sometimes if you look at a tree to the left, look at the caliper of that tree. It was a maple tree that was in a, uh, I think it was a number 20 or 25 container pot bound. We boxed the root system. We put it in pea stone for the summer, pulled it out and, and God, look at that root system. It's just a mop of roots. Uh, sometimes when the when the root system is so thick like this, you you have to use a hose. It, water just 
basically you blast the stone off with with water, any stone that's remaining on there. Um, and it just kind of preserves your, your system. All right. Now, if, if you're getting the idea that I'm basically lazy, it's because I'm basically lazy. And if I can avoid uh, installing and harvesting trees by hand, I am going to do it. So here we are back in Robbinsdale. Previously, it looked like a four-sided bed, but it has one end that can be lifted off. So they can go in with front end loader and harvest the trees like they're doing or uh, stocking the beds too. It just makes things so much easier. Uh, this is in the city of Shakopee. They, they had a, a rock picker bucket on their, on their bobcat, their front end loader, and they use this. This is sweet, sweet, sweet. So if you know somebody that has one of these or if community has one, um, this is a wonderful way because it kind of sifts out the gravel as you're scooping it up. So you just grab the tree trunk, kind of shake it for any remaining stone and harvesting is done. Again, put the, put the trees somewhere, you know, they, they grow a lot of trees. So they harvest trees like this. They lay them down in the shade. They quick hit them with water to keep them moist. And then to the right, um, if they're going to be there for any time at all, like for a day or so, um, they'll spray them with water, and then you can see they're starting to tarp them. And they're going to move these out in mass because um, they have a really good way of transporting their gravel bed bare root trees. And it's the the, the covered uh, trailer to the left. So once they harvest them and they're ready to take them out and plant them, they load them up in there. And this is a community that's planting literally hundreds and hundreds of bare root trees from their, their gravel beds. So it's a pretty big operation. Um, and and they, they can just keep them in that self-enclosed container all day while they're planting. Whereas the, the, to the right, that's Hibbing, Minnesota. Oh, they plant out maybe 50 trees a year and they just bag up the roots, put them in the back of the truck, throw a tarp on them and everything is good. All right. Uh, this is Hennepin County Forestry. So Hennepin County is the largest county in Minnesota, includes Minneapolis. And this particular uh, forestry division with the county, at any one time, they'll have between 1,500 and 2,500 trees in their gravel bed. It's a huge, huge gravel bed, three-sided gravel bed. When it comes time to plant them out, they use volunteers. Um, this is what they do. They, they take the trees, they dip the root system, in a hydrogel solution, which is basically like unflavored gelatin. And it just holds the moisture in the root a little bit longer. Then they put the trees in these number 45 containers. By the way, to the left, you know, soil moist is, is one. There are a lot of brands of it. I'm not promoting soil moist. moist. It's just I had a picture of it. Um, and it does look like uh, that dry stuff on the bottom. And I'll make, I'll make a note on that in a second. But anyway, so once they've dipped it and they're training the volunteers, they, they put the trees in these number 45 containers and then they fill the containers with mulch. And then those containers are moved to the site and they're placed exactly where the trees are gonna be planted, actually off just a couple inches, a few inches. Uh, the people dig the holes, they pull the trees out of the container, plant them, dump the mulch from the container to use as a mulch over the root system of the trees, done. Perfect system. By the way, when you're mixing up, if you decide to use hydrogel, when you're mixing it up, you're going to be adding this, this granular, this powder, and you'll be stirring it in. And you're going to be thinking, wow, this, this, is, this isn't really thickening up very much. I think I'll add another cup. Don't do it. Because the next thing you know, you have concrete. And it sets up it's so thick that you can't even get the root system in there. So you, you just want a slurry. You don't, you don't want a paste or anything. So here they are, they're loading them up. Just, it's just, this is such a great system, especially if you're using volunteers. Uh, and again, with cities that are planting hundreds and sometimes thousands of these trees, anytime they can mechanize is, is a good operation. So they use these drills attached to their, to their, um, articulated drive tractors and it just saves a ton of time and especially if they're having volunteers plant a tree too so to kind of finish things up i want to go through some uh quickly through some lessons learned and if if you don't know me here's a lesson in gary i learned almost everything the hard way i have made so many mistakes 
But what I try to do when I make a mistake is figure out why, why I made that mistake. What did I do that I can correct? So here we go. Above ground beds are the simplest. Do not put them below ground. Monitoring water is challenging. Different trees are gonna perform differently. Isn't that something? And gravel beds grow roots. They don't grow stems and twigs, and I'll explain that. And then they're not year-round beds either. So to me, I look at this gravel bed, this is ideal. It's three-sided. You can you know, harvest, install everything. You can harvest everything with a front-end loader. This is this is going to be your ideal bed, and um, this and it's so easy to take apart too. If you get tired of gravel beds, etc. Monitoring water, there's a, there's you can you can dump a ton of money. So in one of our, our research beds, I decided to dump a ton of money because um, I had it, and I installed a really good um, pipe system in there. Um, I in installed tensiometers that could detect when the moisture level was getting too low and it would kick on the computer and the computer then would kick on the water. And you know, for one bed, it was like $2,500 what it cost me. One of the dumbest things I've ever done. Don't do that, don't do that. The more money you put into something, the, the more frequently it's gonna break down. So here's what I recommend. These pop-up heads and the, the polyethylene, uh, Tubing, you can, I mean, this stuff is so inexpensive. Go go for that. If you don't have rabbits or squirrels, you can use soaker heads. If you look at that meter to the left, uh, you can get that at like uh, Home Depot or Menards or Lowe's. It's, it's less than $40. That is all you need. You're gonna decide uh, when you set the dials, if it's gonna come on, you know, four times a day, and when it comes on, it's going to run for ten minutes. You're gonna you're gonna determine that because uh, you're gonna be digging down in to that gravel to make sure that there's moisture there. Now, if you want to be real frugal with moisture, where you set up your gravel bed is incredibly important. And there's two things: do not set it up where, if you can avoid this, do not set it up where you have a lot of wind because that's just going to dry it out faster. And the second thing is, if you can set it up on a north side or an east side or some exposure where it's it's shaded for most of the day, oh, it's going to be the best day of your life. So shading is important and keep it out of the wind. Uh, and then use your hands to figure out, okay, it needs, to, it needs to be watered again. When's the last time I watered it? Eight hours ago. Okay, I'm going to set the timer for every eight hours. And uh, you can figure out how long to let it run too. All right, different actors, different performances. You know, I look at this root system. Uh, this is this is off a, 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 an oak. It's not bad. It was a smaller oak. It's not. It's not bad. It's kind of so-so. Uh, I look at this root system. Holy buckets! That is. A, that's a nice. This is what I want to see coming out of gravel too. Nice fibrous root system. Um, and it, it, one of the nice things about having fibrous root system, you're rarely going to have to stake these trees to keep them vertical. Just imagine the weight of all the soil on this very fibrous root system. And that's usually enough to keep it vertical. So, you know, just in encapsulating just a few examples, uh, the, the species performance of honey locusts, coffee trees, you know, smaller trees in general, maples, birches just explode, arborvita, I don't know why you'd grow arborvita any other way. I would just automatically put them right in gravel. They do swell in it. The worst, oddly enough, little leaf linden. I already talked about sumac. Uh, you can only, I, I, I just wouldn't even do it anymore, quite honestly. And then calipered hackberry, small hackberry, three, four, five foot hackberry does great. If it's calipered, one and a half, one and three quarter, same thing with the oaks. If you stick with, uh, hackberries and oaks that are up to, I don't know, maybe four or five feet tall, they're going to do well. But once they be, get too big, too big calipers of a caliper, uh, they don't do well. <clears throat> this is very typical for arborvita. Look at that root system. Isn't that beautiful? No, I'm sorry. Couldn't take my eyes off that. Um, this is typical for a Norway spruce. Very, very nice 
root system for a Norway spruce. This is going to do so much better than planting out a seedling. All right, where can you go for information? We have over 100 uh, examples of different trees, species, shrubs, etc. cetera. And uh, if, you, if you look at this website, www.trees.umn.edu, click on, on the top banner, click on Outreach, then click on Gravel Bed, and then click on 2021 Community Gravel Bed Guide. That's, that's my la latest publication. And you can see in here that, uh, for instance, we'll look at uh, Norway maple. Uh, we tested out 20 trees. They're inch, inch and a half to inch and three quarter caliper. Uh, suitability, how well did they do in the gravel bed? They, they, it was good. Transplanting, success, good. And, and when can you transplant them? You can plan, you can pull them and plant them summer through the autumn. Um, and we push the envelope on autumn. I have planted the first week of December more than once. Um, it, it, it's not fun. I wouldn't recommend do it. I just, I do it because it's research and, and I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree. The other thing, gravel beds, they grow roots. They don't grow stems and branches. So all the energy that the tree has when it goes into the gravel bed, it's going to the root system. So if you want a eight foot tall tree, by the, by the time you pull that tree out of the gravel bed, you should plant an eight foot tall tree because it's just not going to put on much. It's not going to put on much growth above ground. All the growth is going to be occurring below ground. So it's, it's not that big of a deal. I just want you to know. And by the way, somebody is going to say, well, how about if we fertilize it? Uh, fertilizing a gravel bed is like taking the fertilizer and flushing it down the toilet. Just think about it. The gravel has no capacity to hold the nutrients and you're irrigating once, twice, three, four times a day sometimes. And it's, it's just flushing those nutrients. Um, so it's, it's a waste of time and, and money. Gravel beds are not year round beds. If you decide, or if, if the autumn gets away from you and you can't get them all planted, if you think that, oh, I wonder if they're gonna make it through the winter. They will make it through the winter, except that it becomes a buffet. This is like old country buffet for deer and rabbits and, and voles and everything. So if you're gonna leave them in a gravel bed in the winter, you have to give either the entire gravel bed uh, wire fencing protection. And if you have voles in the area, uh, that, that means quarter inch hardware cloth. Or if they're just single stem trees, you can use a, uh, tree stem protectors, you're going to have to do it. Otherwise, the, the trees are, are just going to be girdled. All of them will be girdled. Can you imagine a rabbit or a vole or a deer coming up and seeing 100 trees all in 60 square feet? It's like they thought they've died, gone to heaven. So anyway, those are the last of my lessons learned. Um, just acknowledgement, these are the, the many, many people all this research that in earnest started in 2006 was funded by one anonymous and very generous tree lover who thought that bees and trees were the um, answer to all the problems in the world. And, and I still thank that person uh, for funding all of our work, but all these other people too, right down to the nurseries. Nurseries have been so generous donating plant materials um, and other uh, other materials too. So couldn't have done it without these people. So again, my name's Gary Johnson, University of Minnesota, uh, Professor Emeritus, which is just a fancy word for old, retired, but they still let me have an office professor. And uh, I hope this has helped you. Thanks for listening. You should hear me now. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, again, as someone who uses gravel beds, there was so much to learn even for me. So let's jump into questions and answers. Uh, Gary, first of all, can you hear us? And why don't you say something so that we can be sure we can hear you? Oh, okay, I can hear you. There we go. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Hey, may I start with something? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay, this is the errata um, part of it. So at one point uh, I mentioned using four foot posts and putting 18 inches above to hold the sides of the beds and three and a half feet below ground. Um, if you do some quick, this is alternative math. 
which means I, I misstated it. It's 18 inches above ground, two and a half feet below ground, unless you can stretch that four foot, uh, four by four. And then the other thing, this is always interesting when you hear yourself afterward. I mentioned that Fargo was uh, Fargo, Minnesota. This is just an indication of how much I love the city of Fargo, North Dakota, that I, I love it so much that I tend to adopt it um, too often. So those are the two things that I, I caught on there that uh, caused my, my face to get a little bit warm. Nonsense, that was fantastic. Hey, let's jump into some questions here. So two questions. Can you speak a bit on planting density? And then second, yes. you said that you don't intentionally leave trees in the beds over the winter. Is there a way to do this with any level of success? Uh, this person says I'm located in Iowa. Okay, answer the first question. Pack them in um, as tight as you want to. You, you can pack them in so they're uh, edge of the root right next to the edge of the next tree roots, right next to the edge of the next tree roots. Um, with shrubs, a lot of times I'll, I'll let, I'll even let the roots overlap, I'll pack them in. But if you, if you, if you go back to that ANSI uh, Z60.1 standard and they'll say something to the effect of, if your trees are one inch caliper trees, they should have 16 to 18 inch um, root diameters. That's how far you would space them in a, in a bed, 16 to 18 inches apart. Um, now for the second question, I'm gonna say this one more time. I don't advocate that you leave them in the beds in the winter time. Um, the, the, uh, the amount of gravel that you have in there in the four to six inches over the root system, those trees are gonna, the tree roots will survive the winter. We've had, we've had a bed up in Crookston, Minnesota that uh, we overwintered accidentally uh, a, a lot of trees and they all survived. Every single one of them survived. Um, the issue is you're going to have to fence the bed in to keep away the animals. Or if they're all single stem trees, you're gonna have to put stem protection on the trees. That's the only thing you'll have to do. You don't have to worry about mulching over the gravel or anything like that. They're, they're gonna make it just fine. Excellent, thank you. So is the purpose of gravel beds to just grow roots? No, the purpose of gravel beds is to give the organization or the community time to get to trees in the ground. That's the first thing. Um, most, most of us know in the upper Midwest that spring lasts, oh, sometimes it'll last as long as a week. Um, <laughs> and and in, that, in that time period, um, there was, there's always so much other work to do. So you've purchased these bare root plant materials. They're easy to handle. They're much less expensive. And now you have this time crush. Well, if you heal them in, now you can, you can start pulling those plants June, July, August, September, October, November. You have all that time to get them in the ground. So the number one reason for doing this is um, it, it allows you to kind of stage out the, the, the amount of labor hours that it takes to get them in the ground. The other thing it allows is, you know, for decades, the nursery industry has been promoting uh, autumn. Uh, autumn is best for planting, fall for planting. And it's a real good reason. If you can hold off planting those bare root trees until autumn, there is much less of a, of a water demand. The trees aren't losing as much moisture as they are in the spring and summer. And, and so you're going to have a better survival rate. So those are the two reasons. Excellent, thank you for that. Question here on how old are trees when they're put into these beds? Um, if they're a liner, some of the liners, um, let's see, give you an example, cottonwood liners. Cottonwood liners are one year old. You can get older ones, but you know, we, we've put installed one year old liners, pines, one year old liners, hemlocks, one-year liners, and then up to two-inch caliper tree. That's about the largest we've put in there, two, 
two and a quarter inch caliper. Uh, from a nursery, that's going to be a tree that is, oh, depending on the species, between five and eight years old. I love obviously the rehabilitation aspect of it, you know, root bound trees that are maybe even headed for the mulch pile. And so being able to rehabilitate them. Um, and so that would be kind of the upper end of it. And then you were talking actually about sprouting from seed yeah, um, in the gravel yeah. beds. So all the way right. down to that level. Yeah. Yeah. In the recent, by the way, audience, that, that term rehabilitation, that, that, I stole that from Jeff. When we recorded that, he came up with that, and I, and I thought it was just so great. Uh, we have had 100% success rehabilitating pot bound and buried too deeply containerized trees. And, and one of the, the, the advantages of that is a lot of times at the end of the growing season, or in the middle of the growing season, uh, nurseries will start discounting uh, the pricing of those trees uh, because they're hard to keep watered. They're so jam-packed. And, and so you can save a little bit money on that too, or maybe do a little bit of, of bartering on it too. Uh, the idea of growing trees from seeds, it, it, we, we did that to see if we could overcome this uh, dominant taproot system that the nut species seem to have. And it does, it did, it worked, it worked really great. So a nice segue then Gary is a follow-up question. How early in the spring is it safe to place trees in the gravel bed? Uh, and it might, might, might be the same for seeds as well. So could you even plant in the fall um, so it goes through that dormant cycle or that um, scarification and then they just sprout in the spring? That is such a good question, and I'm embarrassed I didn't bring that up. Yes, when you grow from seed, you install them in the autumn, so they can they can be scarified and stratified <laughs> over the winter. Uh, when you're when you're getting in established trees, uh, it depends on the type part of the country. If you can get if you can get your shipment of trees in in first week of April, install them in April. If you can get them in in um, first week of March, install them in March. Um, so yeah. it, it's really more of a situation of when can you get the bare root trees from the wholesale nursery. Got it. Okay. Um, Robin says, thanks for the fertilizer comment. That was going to be her question uh, about dumping fertilizer on them. Uh, I'm new to this, but think she'll try some on some small hackberries, like just uh, some uh, one foot tall ones. So, uh, yeah. Robin, yeah. let us know. Yeah. Oh, hey, Gabe wants to know, are there any special techniques to planting trees coming out of these gravel beds versus the typical tree coming from maybe a nursery in a container or even bigger bald and burlap? Uh, yes, there are some special techniques. One is um, instead of having a, a deep root system, uh, the gravel bed trees are going to, well, they're going to have the roots, the depth is going to be the same as you bought them pretty much from the nursery, but it's the width that is so greatly expanded on them. So instead of digging the, the typical, almost like an inverted bell um, hole for planting the trees, it's going to be a, a much wider saucer. It's going to be shallow, may only be like eight or 10 inches deep, but it could be uh, two or three feet wide. And I know some communities will, um, Use, if they have a lot of trees to plant, they'll use a, a backhoe just to kind of dip down in the ground and scrape back. Uh, and that's versus, you know, if you have a containerized root system or a bald and burlapped root system, you dig according to the shape and the size, which is always going to be deeper. Now, one thing I, I will say to the advantage of having to dig shallow and wider on a, on a gravel bed system is it is a rare rare situation where we've had to stake these gravel bed trees because you have this this really um, thick mat of roots that can be a couple feet wide and you put the weight of the soil over that when you're planting it and that's what stabilizes it and keeps it vertical it's a it is a rare rare situation where we have to uh, put a stake on and this is based on literally thousands of trees Roots are anchors. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. 
Yeah. Uh, is there ever any issue? Oh, hold on a minute. I missed that. It skipped up on me here. Is there ever an issue digging the trees out after a full season with the amount of fine root growth? So would you recommend pulling the trees up once or twice throughout the season to keep them from rooting too deeply? Uh, the, the last option, I would say no. Don't, you, you would just, you would, okay, if, if, you, if you go to that, um, the, the primer that I have online and you look at species performance, and I'm gonna give you, I'll give you the yin and yang in some of these things. With elms, with coffee trees, with black locust, uh, with willows, you want to get them out of the bed in about six to eight weeks, no longer than that. Even, even it, you know, I think it was three years ago, we had to pull autumn blaze maples and, and I had to get them out of the bed uh, on Memorial Day, okay? It was 97 degrees and we pulled them out of the bed. They were fully leafed out. There were 20 of them pulled them out of the bed, planted them. They didn't even wilt. As soon as we pulled them out, we put the roots in black plastic bags, got them to the site plant. They never even wilted. Uh, so, so don't worry about that. So those, those really fast rooting trees, you just don't leave in there very long. You can, you can pull those out earlier if you want to. Um, if you have to leave them in there longer, um, Ohio Buckeye, Burr Oak, White Oak, uh, lindens, uh, those you'll leave in longer and you don't have to lift them because they, uh, the, the roots they put out are much more sparse than like willows and elms and crab apples, et cetera. Uh, so you can leave them in there for three months, four months and, and harvest them easily. But if, if you get stuck with a real obstreperous rooting trees like the elms, et cetera, and you can't take them out until September, Oh, I sure hope you have a front end loader. Or know a lot of young people that owe you a favor uh, that can dig them out by hand because, oh my gosh, it, it is so much like work. Um, and it's hard on your pack too. So those are kind of, you know, hard lessons to learn. But um, those, those are my recommendations. Hey, Gary, a real quick um, tip here that somebody uh, provided and then a couple more questions. So Chip says uh, he's seen a nurseryman use a small stump grinder to dig the yeah. hole so that it's shallow and then just be able to rake the soil over the roots and since yep. you use the stump grinder, it's all ground up and real, real slick. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah, that, that's how the city of Duluth, Minnesota used to plant the trees. And it was it would be this perfect, absolute perfect shallow saucer. This, yeah, if you have one of those, especially if the soil you're planting in is kind of a, a clay soil, it's a little bit harder. Oh my gosh, that's the way to go. Got it, got it. Um, this question is, will black plastic protective tubes kill a newly planted tree? Will the stem think it's a leaf and hence freeze off during the following winter? He sees this a lot in new housing tracks where they don't use actual tree tubes that are engineered, but just like drainage tube or something like that. A any thoughts in general? Yeah, I hate <laughs> I hate black plastic. Um, I think people tend to think that the upper Midwest, it's cold all the time. Not true. You know how hot it gets in the summertime and that heat building up it can, it, with with the newly planted these young trees and shrubs, that that outer bark is like uh, an eighth of an inch thick, sometimes not even that. And the black tubing against them can heat up so much you can actually kill those tissues. So uh, I always recommend a lighter colored if you're going to use plastic tubing, a lighter colored one. Or uh, if you go online, and uh, I think it's uh, I think a period M period Leonard. It's a wholesale horticultural online company. Uh, and look at uh, tree stem protection. And it's, it's, it's black, but it's like black um, fencing. I think it's half inch by half inch, allows really good air circulation. Uh, as soon as air circulation goes through, it brings the temperature down. And, you, and yet the, the stem protectors are excellent 
for deer and rabbit protection. Excellent. And they last for years. Hey, Gary, uh, here's a question from a, a bigger uh, city here in Iowa, Ames, where Iowa State University is, uh, not the Big Ten, so don't worry about it. There's no rivalry there. Uh, so the question there is about being in the bed uh, too long. So the way that they do it is they get seedlings in the spring and essentially um, put them in the gravel bed, grow them out over the summer, and then plant them in the fall. Is that too long or potentially detrimental, or is it more along the lines of the species that you talked about? It's totally along the lines of the species, how strong your back is, uh, how how large the trees were when you put them in. Um, I know a lot of communities kind of uh, stay within the four to five foot tall trees because uh, even the fast rooting ones, if they're only four to five feet tall, they're not that hard to harvest in the autumn. It's when you put in caliper trees that, um, of the fast rooting ones, it, it's just a lot of work to get them out of the gra get them out of the gravel bed. It doesn't hurt them at all. It just kind of it really makes you wish you were 30 or 40 or in my case 50 years younger. Um, it's it's just so much work unless you have a front end loader or a bunch of young people that owe you a favor. Got it, got it. And then a follow up to that is you know that's one of the reasons that they like to utilize that system is to put on root growth and then get them through the summer where they're concerned about drought and having to water a lot. Um, should they be rethinking that a little bit? Um, no, absolutely not. That's the way to think. You know, I, I always ask people this question, what is this summer gonna be like? We have no idea. We have no idea. We could have, you know, parts of Minnesota, this will be our third consecutive year of drought in the summer. Or we could have a ton of moisture, who knows, depending on the part of the state, et cetera. Uh, putting them in the gravel bed where you can control that moisture that is sustaining them, that's the smart thing to do. And then once autumn comes, autumn is just is such a much better time for planting trees. Uh, one last question here. Uh, what about white corrugated tubes? Yeah, they work just fine. It worked fine. It, you know, I think most people know this, so I, I'm not trying to talk down to anybody. If you have any type of tubing protecting the trunks of trees that excludes sunlight, young trees photosynthesize uh, through their bark, their stem bark. And the, the energy that they create during that photosynthesis is used pretty much right there. And that's how they develop caliper. So if you if you put I don't care what color uh, if it's pink or green or white or black against the trunk of a tree and you leave it on there for uh, like a couple seasons even um, that stem caliper is going to be so much less than what it is above that tube. Does it kill the tree? Absolutely not. It just kind of retards it, you know, in terms of uh, caliper development for a year or two. Um, and, and, and so there's no reason to do that when we have better trunk protection systems like the plastic, basically screen type fencing that, that I mentioned before. Um, yeah, go online and, and, and look at that fencing. Um, it works. I've been using it for what, about eight years now. Uh, and, and some of those tubes, the thing is you can leave those on the trees uh, for years and years and years because it allows sunlight and air to circulate through it. You don't have to re try to remember when you installed that and get it off in time. Yeah, just think about it. And no, I don't own that company. <laughs> sense. Hey, I think we're gonna wrap up with one final question here, Gary, and this is one that I'm particularly interested in because I have a couple of these situations. Do you have any recommendations for a gumbo type of soil uh, when we're planting trees and shrubs into it and uh, maybe the recommendation is don't but uh, <laughs> is there anything we can do to and i'm even thinking as far as biochar or just sand or or i don't know any thoughts well you know the old thing about adding sand to a, a poor draining heavy clay it, it basically makes cement or concrete uh, so no, sand. So the first question is, all right, you have a gumbo soil. Is it poorly drained or well-drained? So the very first thing I do is 
I auger in a hole 24 inches deep, fill it with water, let it drain completely, fill it a second time. It should completely drain that second time within 24 hours. If it doesn't, well, it doesn't matter if you're planting in sand or organic or a gumbo, um, you have poor percolation, you have poor oxygen diffusion, you're gonna have poor plant survival. So in a situation like that, uh, I would either, either learn to love willows <laughs> and um, uh, maybe larch, uh, perhaps silver maple planted high, um, or I would, quite honestly, I would haul in soil and create a planting berm, B-E-R-M, and just avoid, avoid the problem. Just bring that in, create your berm three feet high, extend it out as far as you can, and uh, who cares if it's poorly drained below that? It's going to be well drained in the berm. There or learn to love willows. Great suggestion. Thank you for that. Hey, one last one for Sam and Decora. Um, how concerned do I need to be about the roots drying out while the trees are still dormant? Um, in in the gravel bed. In the gravel bed, they're going to be moist. That's the whole point. So right. maybe he's thinking when they pull them. Um, you, you need to be very concerned. Um, those those roots, all the roots are like us. They need they need water. So um, this is when, when you get reports from people that had poor survival rates from bare root tree planting or gravel bed bare root tree planting. It's almost always because when they pulled the trees from the gravel bed, they didn't pay attention to keep the roots moist. So if, if you have problems with that, I, I don't normally use um, any of the hydrogel like uh, Hennepin County Forestry does. But if I was pulling a lot of trees and there was a chance that they could dry out before they actually get in the ground, I would dip them in a hydrogel sluice. Hydrogel is cheap, it is so cheap. Dip it in a hydrogel, put it in plastic, quickly tarp it, water them down under the tarp, get the holes dug before you pull the trees from the tarp or the protection, and then quick get them in the ground, backfill with soil, water them, and, and you should have outstanding survival rate. As good as anything else. But yeah, that's 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 the thing. You know, when you when you're using a lot of supervisors, and I think Trees Forever uses a lot of supervisors, my rule or I mean uh, volunteers, sorry. <laughs> my rule of thumb is one supervisor per five to seven volunteers where you can constantly keep an eye on things and the big things you want to keep your eye on are there keep the roots moist and don't plant too deeply spoken like a true forester hey gary yes. i want to thank you yes. so much uh this has been enlightening we've had a great uh, participation from the folks that uh, were, were on. We're going to be sure we get this out on YouTube, and then we will send a follow-up email to all those that registered. Uh, we had almost 100 that registered and several that couldn't be here, so we want them to be sure they have access to this information as well. And um, now we're just going to have to invite you down sometime uh, to talk in person, Gary, so be prepared for that maybe for next year. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks. Have okay. a great day, everyone. Bye.